All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started today, and uh, I, I want to start today, we're going we're to talk about the issue of racism, and obviously that's a big issue in our country right now. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to James chapter 1, verse 19. And uh, I, I've been doing, over the past two weeks, just a lot of just listening to so many different sources. Um, listening to those on the right, listening to those in the middle, listening to those on the left, just to understand, okay, where are people coming from right now? Just to get a, uh, just to fill the pulse of the nation and, and just to, and I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to write an article that's going to be released next week on our Radical Pursuit email list. Um, if you're not on that list, just join the email list, email.radicalpursuit.net. I'm going to be releasing the, my thoughts on what the Lord has put on my heart for what's going on right now. But in, in James chapter 1, verse 19, James said that, This you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And I think that's a very timely scripture for where we're at as a nation is, is we really need to listen to people, uh, where they're coming from, the angles they're looking at, and uh, the, the, the approach they're having. And the way they view the world is different than the way we might be, view the world. And we need to listen. We need to be very slow to speak. We need to be quick to hear. And we especially need to be slow to anger. Because anger is not going to achieve God's righteousness. Anger is not going to bring about God's justice. Only God's love can bring that about. Legislation cannot do it, though I'm all for any laws that helps anything in this situation. But we know just from the book of Galatians, Paul reveals very clearly that legislation, external commandments can never change the human heart. It's only the Holy Spirit that can do it. And so we're contending for something greater to see this issue of racism in our nation come to an end. And one of the things we're going to do is I'm going to start out um, Terry Bennett, m many of you know Terry, he's, he's spoken here several times, and he's like a father to us at, at our church. The first time he came in, in uh, July 2015, i got to actually pull the reading glasses out here. Uh, so it's my wife's reading glasses, so these are, aren't they great? I, can, I feel like I have goggles on. But July t uh, 17, 2015, uh, Terry, who has incredible prophetic accuracy. I'm going to pull a Ken here. Incredible prophetic accuracy. In fact, what's going on right now, he had been speaking about that since 2001. And he was coming to our church in 2015, and he was approached at his home the night before he came. And it was, he was approached by the principality over Atlanta and a high-level witch. And this witch drew her power from the old wound from the Civil War. I don't know how many people remember him sharing that with us. And, you know, at the time I was thinking, okay, well, what, what do we do with that? I'm sure there is old wounds from the Civil War, but what exactly, how do we handle that? And the principality told him that there is not a city in the nation that has a greater wound than Atlanta. And we have a responsibility, being a church in the Atlanta area, to stand in the gap. And this, this principality, or, or, or Terry was saying that we must awake, talking to us, we must awake, we must battle, we must be equipped. Um, we must war against the hate and the desire for vengeance that is festering under, under the surface of this city. Now, he said this five years ago. This is to us five years ago. The purpose is to prayerfully cons the purpose is to prayerfully counter. God is big enough. I want us to hear this. God is big enough to heal the wound. Amen. All right. We have a wound, and the way I look at what's happening right now, and I said it a few weeks ago, is that if you've ever had a wound and a, a scab forms on that wound and then you scratch that wound, it begins to bleed again. And that's really, I believe, what the enemy is doing. There has been, there has been an age, you know, a centuries-old wound in this nation, even in this city, that has been partially healed, but 
partially not healed, and the enemy is wanting to scratch that wound to stir up civil unrest and strife. And we have a place as intercessors to stand in the gap, to be repairs of the breach, to stand in the, in the gap for this city and for this nation. And uh, uh, Terry said that we, we got to start with our own hearts. And that's really what we're going to be doing today is we're starting with our own hearts is to say, okay, where in us does racism exist? Where in us do we have pride that I'm better than you or I'm, you're better than me because of the color of your skin or some other distinction about you or about me? Is we're going to go right to the heart of this because it starts with our own heart. Is, is the mercy and the love of God is greater than the wound. And, and, and he's, he called for back in 2015, there needs to be a remnant who will go to war over this issue to deal with the wound. And that's us. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to have, Larry is going to speak for about 30 or 35 minutes and about racism from his perspective. And it's an incredible perspective. If you've ever heard Larry's testimony, it's incredibly powerful. The thing that's incredible is, and then, not, and then after that, Dad's going to speak about racism from his perspective. The thing that's incredible is that both of these men, and I'm not calling them old, but both of these men lived in the city of Atlanta during the Civil Rights Movement. So they have a perspective that a lot of us don't have. And so we're going to have them share um, from their perspective of you know, what they went through and the things they saw and what they learned, how they're viewing this through their eyes. And so, Larry, come on up here. And uh, I'm very excited to have Larry. I, I always love hearing Larry's testimony and story. Um, I'm going to give Larry a hug. This could get very awkward. I'm not a hugger. He's not a hugger. And, uh, but we're going to hug each other. <laughs> not a side hug. A hug without pats. That's, that's really, really awkward. Probably the most awkward hug you'll ever see in your life. But, Larry, I love you, brother, and just, you know, feel free to share what's on your heart. Well, I got through the hug anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you guys for letting me speak this morning. You know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at all the turmoil and stuff that's going on in America. My heart has been really burdened the last two weeks tremendously. I couldn't figure out why I would get down. I would pray and weep for America. You see, racism got actually got two edges, like a sword. It's got two edges. There's something out there that I discovered four or five years ago. It's called white guilt. And it's very much alive today. It's more alive today than it's ever been. Uh, just to show you an example before I go into my testimony, looking at Fox News. I hadn't looked at it in about four weeks, or four days. And last night I turned it on, might have made a mistake. I found out another young man got shot downtown Atlanta, uh, which don't help the problem. I also found out uh, that uh, an occupied area in, in uh, one of our cities, major city, Seattle, Washington, a black member stood up for black lives. He looked at all the white members out there and he said, I want all of you to reach into your pocket and give every black member in here a $10 bill. He said, now if you don't do that, you're not for the cause. White guilt. And it's, it's designed to make you feel guilty about something you had nothing to do with. Please listen to me. This is for blacks and white. God has been speaking to my heart lately, and that is some major stuff going on there spiritually. You can't see it, but you know it's there. Because that guilt feeling, a lot of you know what it's like. You saw that young man get killed on, on, on um, television, and that was a horrible thing to see. Had nothing to do with racism, had nothing to do with anything that's, that we consider, but the problem is what you had was an awesome feeling for that man. You felt that feeling, right? We all felt that feeling. Well, then all along come the free marchers, the peace marchers, and entwined in that is the troublemakers. They come to bring white guilt. So be aware of what you feel now. Be aware of how you react to everything going on. But the most amazing thing is this. In all my grieving and all the time, things I went to, I kept hearing this little voice saying, I'm in charge. 
It may be dark, y'all, but there's a light. And if we continue to pray on that light, it's going to get brighter. But we got to believe. And it don't matter what's happening around us, the light is still there. Even when we can't see it, it's still there. And I say that to say this. Racism as we know it today, it don't exist like it was when I was around. So I'm going to go to a few uh, uh, things, a couple of things. My book going to be coming out real soon, I hope, and then I'm planning on doing another one. Believe it or not, I'm probably the dumbest person in the world, but I'm trying to write books now. The, uh, in the 60s, I remember at the age of 14, I went to reform school. Even in the reform school, well, before I got to reform school, the first time I went to jail, you had the whites here and the blacks here. Well, they separated us. Even when we went to prison, to jail, Mary Ann, the reform school in Florida had a highway go through there. The whites was on one side and the blacks was on one side. We were not allowed to associate. This was what I went through in the segrega segregated years, I guess you might say. Well, when I got out of reform school, I went to stay in a place called Perry, Florida, which is a very bad place back in those days. In fact, somebody said the reason the clock on the courthouse was never, ever, was never, ever whole time like it's supposed to was because once they hung a black man with the, with the uh, handle of the clock, he stood there until that thing tightened up and hung him. That happened in Perry, Florida. Well, one night in Perry, Florida, I was working late at the at the uh, cedar mill uh, me and uh, four other guys and we was walking because we had to work late so we would walk we had to go through town go across the railroad you see the law was if you was a black man a black woman you wasn't allowed to cross that railroad after dark and while we was walk while we was working now this is what i experienced guys i'm just trying to tell you what i experienced when i came along compared to what people are saying exists today because the thing that they what they don't understand there's no rights that i have that he don't have what did that happen so when people look back and holler, racism, uh, 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 white privilege, whatever, what are they talking about? It's demonic. It's a setup. But, but at that time, I didn't have those rights. And while I was walking down that road, me, us four guys, the, the police pulled up beside us, a deputy police, and he looked at us. He said, why are y'all across this uh, railroad track at night? And we tried to explain to him we had worked. Late and we were leaving the meal. He got on the radio, called in. They called the, shop, uh, the, the meal and found out we had been working late, so he let us go on. He said, Now get across that road and don't be caught over here no more. I even remember one time I was called across town when the Ku Klux Klan was having a parade. I had to run that day. I'm serious. I would run, y'all. I mean, I'm not so crazy I won't run. I will run. <laughs> well, I won't now, but then I would, you know. But uh, that wasn't the worst time, though. One time I remember I went to New York, worked up to New York for a few months, bought an old car, came back with New York Place on it, driving down the road, High River Patrolman pulled me out the car, pulled me over, pulled me out the car. I had to lay in the middle of the road, spread eagle, on my face, and I had to lay there for an hour while he searched my car. Every three words were the N-word, but guess what? I survived that too. I, uh, when I finally became an adult one time, well, before that happened, something else happened. We, we, me and two other fellas, uh, we was fishing one night, a place called Rattlesnake Island in Perry, Florida. We had to walk back to the pickup to get there, and we saw a light in the in the woods, and so we wanted to go there and kind of see what it was. And what it was, it was a Klang rally. The cross was burning, huge cross burning. And they was whipping, believe it or not, they was whipping a white guy because he wasn't taking care of his family. And when they finished whipping him, they put a bag of food, a couple of bags of foods in his hand and told him to go home. Well, we went on, went on about our business. We got in the old pickup truck and we got out to the road. We get out to the road, the highway patrol is out there waiting on us. We didn't know they had saw us. And he did a flashlight thing, signal. They came along, they picked us up. The clan picked us up in a station wagon and took us back to the party. The intention was to scare something out of us, and they did. They did a good job on that part of it. Nobody was hurt, though, but they eventually turned us loose. You don't see, that don't happen today. I'm here to say that don't happen today. But this is what I experienced back then. This was the life of a black man. The N-word coming out of the white, a white man's mouth wasn't nothing common. It was, it was something you expect sometimes. But like I said, I went to jail when I was very young, and I finally became a, an adult prison. I get into prison. <laughs> I get into P 
Petersburg, Virginia. First time I ever been in prison for in my life. And what do I walk into that but a big, uh, I mean, it was so much pressure and tension in that racially. They knew it was coming. They, they, just, they just didn't know when. They knew it was going to be a big shakeup in there. And the first thing happened, I'm walking out because in the reform school, I became a black Muslim, y'all. Y'all know about my Muslim life as praying out loud and all that stuff. Boy, what a jerk. <laughs> but I get into prison, so I join the Muslims. When you get into prison, you're a black man, you uh, Islamic, you, you're going to go straight to the Muslim. And if you're somebody of reputation, they're going to come to you. But I've joined the Muslim, and the Muslim was the one that was stirring up the trouble. They were the one that p recruiting young blacks to be a part of the coming war, they said. And the goal was, I'm sitting there hearing this, and the dude already told me, Larry, you can be out of here in a year and a half if you can keep your nose clean. And I remember standing up that night in front of all these black guys, about 700 of them in there, and I told them, I said, listen, guys, I'm going to be out of here in seven months if I keep my nose clean. I don't want no part of this. You know, I don't really want no part of this. I, I had some issues, guys, a lot of issues, you, whether you know or not. But I can remember after it was over, this tall Muslim guy walked up to me. He said, do you have a shank? And I said, no. He gave me a shank. He put a shank in my hand. He said, now listen, when the fighting gets started, if I don't see you trying to kill white people, I'm coming after you when it's over. The good news was I was, I couldn't sing back then, guys. I was one of the type of guys, you see, I talk about making a jawful noise. My noise wasn't even jawful. That's how bad I sang, you know. So what, what I did, I hooked up with uh, two other guys that were teaching me how to sing, two black guys and two white guys. Uh, they played guitar, the white guys doing these two black guys. They really knew music. So we spent most of our time just learning how to sing. And this morning, for some reason, the white guy walked up to me and he said, do y'all want to go out in the yard and practice some? We was in the dining room. I said, yeah. We, went out. we said, let's go out in the yard you know, and practice. Just as we walked out the dining room, this dining room was a huge building. It looked kind of like a, a multi-sized uh, waffle house, but it had two floors. And when you walk in that place, because the tension was so bad, you had the, the, white guy, the black guys on, 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 on upstairs and the white guys downstairs. They wasn't associating. And the poor Mexican guy was over in the corner. You know, because it wasn't that many of them. <laughs> and so we walked out of that place. And as soon as we walked out to go get his guitar, right about up in that door, everything in the world could break out. You hear it, you heard it, the kitchen and dining room. They just, it started, the riot started right then. It's good. God had just removed me out of there. Uh, and, and when I did, because we heard, we turned around, we knew what it was. But see, it was dangerous because back in those days, they served us on trays that was metal trays that were flat. And the damage you can do with one of those trays. And so we hit this loud noise, and then we hit a loud speaker, so everybody hit the deck, anybody standing. Anybody outside that will be standing, if you hit the deck, stay on your stomach. If you move, you're dead. And I could see all these sirens, I could see all this gas flying, all tear gas flying, and I'm laying... <laughs> in a bed of tear gas about that high. And I mean, I am, I'm having problems. So I remember ripping my shirt off and tying it around my head so I can breathe. The next thing I noticed, I heard this, this running. And then all of a sudden, I felt a foot on my back and a gun at my neck. And tell me, if you move, you're dead. And my head was sideways, and I saw this young blonde guy inmate jump up and try to head back into the dining room because the tear gas was bothering him. And the bullet hit him in the shoulder. He turned around and fell, and he got up again. The next one killed him. And I sit there and I watch that thing go on for hours. How dumb. You know, I, I just want to do my time. When it was all over, there was 75 dead, over 200 injured. What was it for? Because we're different? You know, I like to say this thing when I'm talking about racism is that if we was all the same color, then the short people would be in trouble. <laughs> because that's the why. Because somebody's using our difference against us. It's that devil. Well, I eventually got out of jail. It's the most amazing thing in my life. I'm a young black Muslim, so if I walk up, I'll say, I'm like, you know, I thought I was doing something big because I really wanted to get into Islam, deepness, the deepness of it. I never looked at the reason I ever got into it in the first place was because of my blackness. It had something to do with my blackness. And somebody kept saying, well, white man religion is Christianity, and black man religion is Muslim, Islam. I said, well, I thought. Christianity came out of Jewish religion. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more Jews? And, but the problem is I get out, and I got to go see my parole officer. And you know when you got to go see your parole officer, you got to go see your parole officer. And I'm walking 
from Perry, Florida. I had to go from Perry, Florida to uh, to uh, Tallahassee. So I had to walk to the bus station. I was running. I was late because I had been working late. And I got to the the guy's office uh, 30 minutes late. And I walk in there and I'm full of fear. And I walk up to the secretary and she smiles. She says, yes, he's waiting on you. And I said, oh, God, I'm in trouble. And I open the door and this guy jumps up. Tall white guy jumps up and run behind up behind the desk and run up there and extend the hand. You must be lively. And grab said, Now come sit down. Tell me something about yourself. And I'm saying, This something ain't right here, you know. This is this ain't what I was expecting, you know. And then he says something like this, honey, he's here. And then his wife, she comes out of the, the office kitchen with a a thing in her hand, a, something in her hand with a towel over it. A fresh baked apple pie. They gave me an apple pie. Now I'm really getting suspicious. <laughs> I'm saying something ain't right about these white people here. <laughs> something <ain't> right here, <laughs> you know. I mean, that was, I mean, I'm expecting him to holler at me. He didn't holler at me, though. The most godly man I ever met in my life. When he asked me about my faith, I told him I was a Muslim and kind of struck my check out like I'm big. He said, can we lay hands on you and pray for you? That was when it started, guys. After that, it seemed like everything in my life I did was dumb, but God was there to protect me. That day, they claimed me for God. And he asked me what I wanted to do in life. I told him, I want to operate a dozer. I always want, and still today, I never operate a bulldozer. I want to operate dozers. I like the idea of it. Don't ask me why. It's just something in me. So he said, go back to Perry. Find somebody to do that business and agree to help them do maintenance and stuff like that. They'll teach you. So I went back, and I go to the Patrick Company. And this huge guy sitting in there, he's a short guy. Um, he's a little taller than me, but he weighed about 335 pounds. He's a big guy. And I, he's sitting behind the desk, and I told him what I said. He said, yeah, I spoke with your parole officer. He said, that's a good idea, son. He said, I tell you what, you come back two weeks on a Monday after I talk to my brother when he get back in town, and we'll see if we can't get you set up. Well, I'm all excited by getting my life. Because, see, I didn't want to become a criminal, which I eventually became. Because that's the way I was, that's the road I was heading down because I had problems, people. I had some serious problems. And so I um, come back that month all happy, ready to go to work, going to jump on those doze and learn our doze. He said, listen, my brother and I haven't talked yet, so I'm going to hook you up with this group here. I'm going to hire you today to start to work, but I want you to work with this group here, their clearing group. What, so this is what I'm saying, being a logging company, what we do, what they did in Perry, Florida, they cut down the trees clear the land, dig up all the stumps, and clear the land and replant trees. Now, they had something called virgin land. That's land that um, they have never did that on before. And they go now with these extended saws and cut trees down there. It was so infected with diamondback rattlers, you had to be real careful because they was all over the place. In fact, when they cut a tree down, our job was to go in there and dig the stump up and drag it on a pile and burn it. And so what we would do first, walk up to a stump and hit it with the hammer, hard as we can, a uh, sludge hammer, and we'll hit the rattlers. Then we take a, a hose and stick it down in there, pull gas down there and blow through the hose and the snakes would come out, they couldn't stand the smell of gas. And so what we do, get up on the back of the truck while they do all that, you know. And I tell you, that's been a lot of time I've been working and turning and look and see a rattler sitting there rattling at me and stuff. You know, it's been a lot of time I see that. And when the saws are running or something like that, you got to be careful because you don't hit them things. And so I went through this for eight months. And one day this guy visited the job. He was on the tractor talking with the foreman. And it was during my lunchtime. And these other old black guys that worked there, they always told, they laughed at me when I told them I was going to drive a doze and all that. And this one, he had been bit so many times by a snake, his hand was just like that. It couldn't, he couldn't move it. And, and he always called me Junior. In fact, one day he, would, he would hollered at me and said, hey, Junior, you got one behind you. And he's triggered. The word trigger means that a snake is in a call. But when you see his head go back like that, he's triggered. That means he's ready to, he's ready to strike. And when he said that, I thought, well, he's joking. I don't hear no, no, hear no rattling. Nothing. And just as I turned, he was right. The snake triggered. And I went by like that, and the snake went by me like that. That's how big he was. And the reality was he was triggered, but he never rattled. That was kind of unusual, but he said they do that sometimes, you know. But anyway, I told him I was going to confront this old man. And I went there, and I confronted him. I told him, I said, listen, Mr. Patrick, this ain't what you told me I was going to be doing. I've been here eight months, and I'm dodging around snakes. I said, I can get a job anywhere. This is not about a job. And he looked at me, and please forgive me for what I'm finna say. He said, well, I thought about that day, son, you came to my office. He said, but you know, driving a bulldozer ain't a good job for a nigga. 
I didn't know who he was. I never knew who he was. I found out later he was, uh, he was the leader of the Klan in that, town, that county. And he was playing a game with me and my parole officer when we came in there. And they sort of laughed at me when I said the guy on the track there. I said, well, I guess that's telling me I need to go then, you know. And he said, hold it just a minute. You don't, you know, y'all don't quit me. He, he used the N-word again. So you don't quit me either. He said, you go and I tell you you can go. But in the meantime, they like your work, and so we want to keep you on. I said, not me. He said, no, you, you stay here. So he reached down and picked up a limb off a, a root. He started switching it around. He said, y'all grab that boy and y'all hold him. The, 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 the bad news was that he said that. The good news was I was called a rabbit. Them people was too old to catch me. I was gone. I got out of there. But the anger was still there. I had a serious anger problem. And I, it bugged me that I had to kill this man. I was going to kill him. Somewhere or another, I got to kill this man. But I had to do it in a way that nobody knew who done it. So I went to, went to Tallahassee, broke in a gun store, stole a bunch of guns, one particular rifle with a scope on it. Went down in the woods, and I practiced on shooting that guy. You see, again... That prayer that my parole officer put on me had God in my back pocket. I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. So even though I wasn't saved, man, I'm telling you something. You don't have to be saved for somebody to pray for you and God to get on your case. Let me tell you something. You, you may be, what you say, you may be a drug seller or you may be a thief or whatever. Hey, God, hey, I'm telling you, it'll mess up your business. <laughs> and that's what happened with me. They messed up my business. Because I had planned on killing this man. I actually crawled up in the tree with, the, with, with my rifle and everything. Got up in there. A nice, solid old-fashioned tree with a big limb on it, but the limb broke. You tell me, God, that limb wasn't supposed to break. And I left that day because my hip was hurt, and I left the gun up against the tree, and I left with intentions of coming back. I never got back. Some things went on in my life. I got in one of the worst wrecks. Again, God was me. I had one of the worst wrecks you could have and survived it. I would let you, just picture this, putting gas in your car, Someone hit your car and sideswiped your car and rolled you between the cars. My door was open and even ripped the door with me between the cars. Dropped me at the front bumper. Everything below my waist was broken. I wasn't supposed to live. In fact, Perry, Florida, rolled me to the side because they couldn't help me. Show you how the devil worked. Miss Rosalie loved my adopted mother. She called the hospital to check on me. The first nurse she spoke to said, yeah, he's dead. And uh, he immediately, she immediately had to recall the parole officer and tell him. And she called him. He had to call to confirm it. But when he called to confirm it, the head nurse spoke to him and said, no, he's not dead yet, but he's going to be in about three hours. And he got back and talked to her to put him in an ambulance and get him to Gainesville, uh, the University Hospital. And that saved my life. Do you see the confusion? See how the devil do? In the simple things, a little confusion. Just like that, I'd have been gone. And when I came out of the hospital, that guy called and told me, that parole officer called said, you ain't no Muslim. You belong to Jesus. I know because I claim you for Jesus. And the day that you wake up and see that, it's going to be a big light in your face. You're going to see it. You're going to understand this. Well, those were some of the things that happened. Now, the reason I told you that particular story about that, this, the, 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 the clansman was because I did eventually get saved. And the most awesome thing happened to me is still the day that that really explains a lot about racism and everything. It don't care what it is, how big it is. Jesus can move it, y'all. I think about 25 years later, after I had gotten saved, I went back to visit Perry, Florida. And I go to this particular store, corner store, and I get a drink, Lewis get a drink, we get to get back in the car, and I look up the sign on the store, said Patrick, corner store. I noticed outside there was some men on the front there. There was one white man, a little skinny white man, and, and two black guys playing checkers, having a good time with a Bible between them, you know. And so I walked back inside. I want to get check on this. I said, listen, man, you in the kin to Red and O.B. Patchett? He said, yeah, I'm O.B.'s son. I said, well, where's O.B.? He said, O.B.'s dad. I said, uh, whatever happened to Red? Remember, Red was about 330-some pounds. He said, Red, I thought playing checkers. This guy might have been 100 pounds if he was wet, sitting there playing checkers. And something spiritually began to happen to me, guys. I was saved. I had did time. I had been. I was saved, man. Just to show you how God worked. 
And I walk out there and I look at that old man and he's playing checkers and he had a walker by him because he had had a stroke. I didn't know, you know. And it was red, but he had lost all that weight and he was playing checkers. And these guys, he's just having a good time with these black guys. That wasn't the red that I knew. That red I would knew would rather lynch them than have fun with them. But he's sitting there playing checkers. And I look at him and I can feel the spirit of God moving on me, y'all. It was awesome. And... Um, he, he asked his, son, his nephew to give him a drink of water. He put the glass there. His hand was shaking. He couldn't even pick up the water. And God just happened to put me where, where I can be between him and the water. And he looked up at me and said, son, can you help me with that water? I picked it up, and I gave it to him. He drank the water. I said, ah, oh, that's good. God bless you, son. And looked up at me. Let me tell you something, guys. God was doing something because I realized something. I had a lot of unforgiveness in me, even as a Christian. And I left there. I couldn't speak for hours. And I said, I got to go back up there and see this man tomorrow before I go back to Atlanta. And I came back that morning, and he was sitting in a rocking chair in front of the counter, rocking, and his nephew was behind the counter. And he was reading the newspaper, and I got in right in front of him and got down on my knees, and I looked that old man in the face. I said, do you even know who I am? He looked at me, he rolled the paper, took a fold of paper, laid it down, and he looked dead in my eyes and said, no, son. He said, but if it's got something to do with my past, Jesus forgave me, can you? God is good, y'all. I got up. And I sit down beside that man, and we sit there, and we talked for four, about two hours about the goodness of God. Never brought it up what happened between me and him, just the goodness of God. I never found out what happened to him, what changed him, except his sister said he came home one night. He was a very wealthy man. He came home one night. She said he was broken. Every, for about weeks there, every two or three hours, he just break down and go to crying. They don't know what happened to him, but it changed his heart. And he became a friend of me until he died about five years ago. And his sister asked me to come to Perry and do the music at his funeral. That was God. The other time I want to do, and I'm going to probably make this my last one, is uh, when I was in prison after I'd gotten saved, one way that we as Christians was doing prisons, that we would just put together a prayer group after church at night. We'd come in. I mean, after work all day, we'd come in, take a shower, have dinner, and then we'd go to the dining room. It was nine of us. We'd sit down. We'd talk about the problem that was going on with the families and everything. we all pray over that. And this was the thing we did every day. So they assigned two officers to stand guard over us to make sure that, you know, we wasn't doing anything wrong. And eventually those two guys also became saved, and they also became a part of the group. So it went up to 11. And we would pray. But the guy that was leading the group was from South Georgia. He was on some tax thing there on in prison. He had some months to do because of some kind of tax thing. And a uh, very godly man. And he sit down there. He would sit beside me. And I would sit down beside this man. And I feel very uncomfortable. He's an old white Georgia man. I mean, he talked like Goma Piles. I mean, that's how South Southern he was. You know, he just, but he was a godly man. But I didn't notice it wasn't just him I was having that problem with. I was having that problem with other white guys, too, that was in the group. And one day on the yard, watching the guys play ball, a guy sit beside me telling me, a black guy, he's know that white guy that controlled y'all, that's in charge of y'all group, here y'all group? I said, yeah. He said, man, that guy's a racist. And boom, it snapped. That's what I sensed, a spirit of racism. I could feel it. That might sound crazy, but I could feel there was something going on. So I immediately, I said, God, I got to figure out a way to confront this man, to tell this man that, hey, we need to work on that. When I run to my bed, God, you know, God's amazing how he do stuff. I run to my bed. I get on my bed for two days. I'm praying straight. God show me. I'm meditating. I'm doing everything. So I want God to bring this back to me. And one day, I'm laying there meditating with the Bible over my face on my bunk. And I heard the Holy Spirit as clear as I ever heard him. He said, Larry, it's not him, it's you. I'm, I'm a black man. I can't be a racist. But I was. You don't dabble in the stuff I dabble with without it becoming a part of your life until you release it. Hours later, me and that old white man and also the other guy, we laughed about that thing. We prayed and we released it. See, you, you can have those problems and don't know it. 
You can look at me and say, he's different. That don't make you a racist. When you define the word racism, what it means, an individual that judges another individual or look at another individual and consider himself superior to him because of the color of his skin, that's racism. Can I tell you something? If I had a child playing football, and you parents know what I'm talking about, and you got a child playing football, you're going to think more of your child than you are mine, right? What does that make you? A parent. But that's the same way it is with us. People, I don't believe racism is like it was in the day that I came up. I dealt with racism. I seen clans, I, hey man, I seen so many clansmen sheets and them covers, what they was wearing. I seen so many of them things that don't, it, it just don't matter to me. But what do matter to me is today, God is speaking to us and he's saying, look at me, don't look at that, look at me. Because that's what we got to do now, people. It's getting bad in America. And ain't, listen, black lives matter. Please, if there's any black people in here that really, brothers and sisters in here that don't like that, let me tell you what black lives are is. It's very divisive. Because all lives matter. If we can't say all lives matter, including black lives or including blue lives, if we can't say that, then guess what? It's divisive. And the reason... We had so much burning downtown in these cities it's because, they, first of all, I tried, I'm trying not to get political, but when you got a bunch of liberal lawyers, I mean, excuse me, governors and, and liberal mayors, they don't know how to deal with stuff like this. They allow it to go on because they think that'll be good. Just let them have their fun, and when it's over, it'll be okay. And then the town is burnt down. If we're going to get through this, guys, and we are, I'm here to tell you this morning, we're going to get through this. It looked bad. There's a lot of stuff I can do here on racism that I ain't going to do. But I can say this in. I'm going to say this, and I hope y'all forgive me. Uh, don't vote Democrats. I wasn't going to get political. Don't vote Democrats. Come on, people. We are life lovers. We love Jesus. He said, you know, I put before you this day life and death. Choose ye life. How can you vote for a party that want to kill babies? And it ain't going to stop there. They're going to start killing babies after they're born if they have their way. So right now, what we need to do, if you're going to vote, pray about it. I promise you, if you pray about it, God is going to tell you not to vote Democrats. Okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel. I think, I, I, it, you know, people probably say, well, you know, you're wrong. But, see, I voted for Democrats. I'm still apologizing for campaigning for Jimmy Carter. Seriously, man, we got we to we gotta look at what's going on here. We got to understand something is wrong in this country. The burning, the cities that are burning, who are the governors? Who are the uh, 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 mayors? Democrats. I'm not saying the Republicans are so much better, but I'm just saying the proof is in the pudding. It's right there in front of you. Something is wrong with the way those people think. And I ask God to forgive them. Now, they do need to forgive them. We need to pray for them and bring them along, but they're getting very rowdy. But I want to say this to all my brothers and sisters that are, I can't say this in a loving way, that are Caucasians. Okay, let me tell you something. I love you like you're black. <laughs> I don't care about color. I got over that a long time ago, man. We got to go, man. We got we to get this thing together. And, and, and another thing, too, this bur listen, I'm, I love football, y'all. I can't even watch football no more because everybody want to take a knee. <laughs> everybody want to get down on a knee. Why? Because they hate that flag. Let me tell you about the flag, y'all. I love that flag. I, I, I got allegiance to that flag twice. Once because it's the flag of America, the country that I love. And another is because the young men that march from the now north and march to the south to free my ancestors flew under that flag. So that flag is special to me. And let me tell you something. I only got one good knee left, and I'm going to get after Jesus, and that's it. I'm not giving nobody <laughs> my knee. I'm sorry about that. But uh, listen, I thank you guys for letting me speak to you. It might sound kind of funny, but my heart is this, that one day, the vision I saw in prison, I had a dream one night, and I saw a vision where everybody was reaching towards heaven. Black, whites, every national world, it was reaching towards that light in the sky. 
That's my vision. That's my dream. Color don't matter. And, and it's like somebody once said that there's no railroad tracks in heaven. So we got to deal with it now here. So racism, it ain't what it used to be because it hasn't, it don't have that particular flavor power. But I got to say this, and this is when, when he was talking to me about this yesterday, and I prayed about it and this morning, even doing praise, God spoke to me again about it. He's trying to come back. I'm talking about white racism is trying to come back. Why? When you see people walk around talking about Black Lives Matter, and you see the only university you got in the black universes, Miss Black Universe, and you see all that stuff, and you begin to wonder, what's wrong? And those people out there that don't have Jesus in their heart that are white, they begin to think the wrong way. That's understandable. So we got to pray and ask God to help them to see it and understand it. But the spirit, because, think about this, Al Shop and those people, they are designed to try to get this stuff stirred up. They want it back so they can see it and make them look like they are right. You know? But racism is not where it used to be. I'm, I'm trying to do a book on racism now, y'all. Guys, pray for me because, boy, it's amazing. Like I said, all these books I'm trying to write lately. And I, I, I'm serious, guys. I still write in tongues. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that, that's no joke. My writing is not clear. Okay? So, but anyway, just pray for me because I really want to do this book that I'm trying to do on racism. I think it needs to be done. Somebody got to speak to this stuff. And pray with me that God will call for more mature black Christian men to stand up with this thing. I know they're out there. We just got to pray for them to come forth. Thank you very much. God bless you guys. I want, I want to stop this time. I want, I want to invite my friend and my pastor, Ken Kessler, to come up and, and hopefully, hopefully I haven't said nothing dumb. So y'all still love me out there? Okay, that's good. That was good then. Okay. That's great, Larry. That was really good. It's a hard act to follow here, Ray. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, Larry, Larry and I have been friends for 25 years now or so. If we met in 95 or 96 when uh, we were, the, he was down at Blood and Fire and um, uh, we were working down there with him and trying to get some stuff going for the Olympics and I met him there and he came up and uh, to the church and part of the, some worship, and we've been friends ever since. So it's been really, really a powerful thing. Um, what I want—I'm I'm sure I won't be nearly as interesting as Larry's message, but I, what I want to do is I want to talk. Mainly, my message is to the whites among us because uh, what the Lord has put on my heart. You know, we're we're, we're preparing for this prayer assignment where God really wants to use us, I really believe, in a very powerful way to be agents for him to heal the wounds of racism in Atlanta. And what the Lord has really spoken to me uh, uh, over as we've dealt with those things, over as we've kind of meditated on that word, is as Atlanta goes, though, so goes the South. So I really believe there's a powerful opportunity for us to to be used as a fellowship uh, to bring a healing um, and you know you think about the, the 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 magnitude of the problem it's so large of, a, of an issue uh, nationwide you think how in the world could we ever be used uh, to bring be agents of healing uh, of that we're just a few people here but it's not us, it's, we're just earthen vessels, but it's the treasure of Christ within us that as we deal with whatever God says to deal with in our own lives, plus to be um, agents of intercession and, and uh, spiritual warfare, then God can bring a healing anointing. I really believe that. And so the word would not have come forth through Terry if it weren't something that is po possible. So I think that is the way uh, we need to, to approach this this week. It'll probably only be the beginning, but it'll be something that God really wants to do. But I, I want to just share a little bit from about racism growing up from the white perspective. Um, Larry and I are about the same age, and so we kind of grew up in the same uh, time frame. And so this is kind of my thoughts of what I remember growing up as a 
as a young white man in uh, the city of Atlanta. I grew up in Hapeville, which is uh, down by the, where the airport is uh, and everything. Um, but I remember really clearly, you know, it's probably, say, early to mid-50s. I, I was born in 47, so probably, say, mid-50s as I would begin, begin to remember what life was like there. And uh, we lived in a very, uh, it was a very racist environment in, in Atlanta back in the 50s and, and 60s. I remember just some of the things that I remember. I, I remember that uh, really clearly, I could just see it in my mind now, you, in some of the department stores there in Havel, you'd have two water fountains. You'd have the, uh, the one, and they'd have a label on them. And one would say white, and one would say colored. That was what they uh, said uh, at the time. And you, so that was just like uh, life was there. I mean, in, in the restaurants, uh, blacks were not allowed to go into the, to the restaurants that whites went, uh, went to. Uh, the schools were all uh, integrated. I went to, a, I mean, uh, segregated. I went to a, a segregated school. There were no, uh, y there were no black people at all, and in, in even through high school and all that. And you know, the theme back then was be separate but equal. Uh, that was what, the, and that was kind of like what most of the white people believed at that point in time: separate uh, but equal. Uh, which, you know, was very racist, really, when you think about it. But at the time, uh, I didn't think, I mean, I wasn't really interested. I didn't really care. I thought that's just life. And, you know, I was just interested in uh, playing ball and, you know, going to the lake and things like that. Uh, but there was, a, you know, there was that. There was the, the buses where, you know, riding the, the bus to, from Hateville up to Atlanta, you know, you would see and all the, Blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. So that was uh, just the rule. I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's a law. And if a black decided to sit in the front, uh, you know, that was everybody would think, oh, what, you know, what's going on there, and uh, all of those things. Uh, employment only. The blacks only got the lower income uh, jobs uh, uh, back then, uh, and even churches. That was a, that was a one thing that I remember. Uh, and let me just say this about my parents. You know, I, when I was growing up, I, I really do think this would be the case. Uh, looking back on it, my parents were racist. But if you compared them to what was going on with some of the stories that Larry shared and other things, they were not at all racist. And I think they would have thought, thought they weren't racist. And I'm going to have a point in sharing this for, for us who are, who are white, um, they would say they weren't racist. But, you know, just I'll use the, the example of going to church. Uh, we were part of the Methodist church, and, um, you know, there was a big conversation coming. You know, there were no blacks at, the, at our church, and, and in any of the church, white churches in Hateful. The blacks had their church, and the whites had their and their big discussion was, what are we going to do if a black person wants to come visit our church? And um, the, the conversation with my parents and their friends were, well, it'd be okay if they were really wanting to worship. Uh, but they're not. They would just want to become, to integrate our church. And my thought now would be like, I could just see God saying, don't worry about it. I'm not going to send a black person to that church. I said, I'm not even coming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a dead, dead Methodist church. Um, but th that's, um, that was kind of the environment I grew up in. Um, you know, even when Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated, you know, my only f concern about it really was that uh, you know, I was hoping there wasn't any kind of ra uh, violence or things because I was going to college back at that time downtown Atlanta, and you know, I didn't want to get caught in the middle of all that. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't really think of myself as being uh, racist or as my parents being racist. In, in comparison, they probably weren't. Uh, but here, here's the point I want to make: looking. Looking back on those days, looking from looking at now, looking back 30, 40, 50, or whatever, 50 years ago, whatever it was, 
number of years ago. I look back on all that, the attitudes that I had and my parents had, and I thought, man, this, they're extremely racist, you know, in comparison to the mindset today. Um, and so here's the point I want to, I want to make, and I, and I want us to, to pray into it for the, uh, you know, for th this would be for, really for the whites in our midst. Uh, we look back on those 20 or 30 years ago, 50, 40, 50 years ago, and we say what I thought was not racist at all was extremely racist. And so my question I've been asking myself, and I, and, uh, I want us all to ask ourselves this question, what are those attitudes in our heart right now that we don't think are racist but really are? And the Lord wants us to go free from that, you know, whatever that may be. It may be, it, it's, I, I don't sense there's anything in this fellowship where there's uh, any kind of, you know, overt racism, as we would think. I don't think of that at all in any, anybody in our fellowship. But what is it in our hearts that, that may be racist and we don't even know that it's there? And if we're going to be an agent for healing of the wounds, uh, then, the, the, you know, we have to root out every spirit of racism uh, out of our hearts and out of our life, even those things that we might not even be aware of. And there might even be, uh, you know, demonic spirits there of racism within us that we don't even know that are causing us to think a certain way or to feel a certain way or to act a certain way that we might be blind to. And so we were feeling, as we were praying about what to do, we really felt that it's now is the time to deal with that prophetic word uh, that Terry uh, had come up with in 2015. We had done, we had prayed into it. We, you know, a group of us even went up to uh, Chickamauga Battlefield to kind of do research on the Civil War and to see how we could go into those kind of roots and uh, you know, nothing. We never felt anything to do. We just, there was no, just nothing that seemed like it was time. But with all that's going on now, we feel like, okay, this is the time to deal with that uh, prophetic word that, that was shared specifically to this house, to be healing, uh, agents of healing of the wounds. And, but I think the first step is for us today uh, to deal with any issue of racism in our hearts. Uh, whether it's the whites among us or the blacks among us, because God's goal is to to have us one, where there's no uh, Jew nor Greek, nor male or female, uh, or black nor white. It's we're, we're one uh, to be one in Christ. And so, um, anyway, I think we need to pray. Maybe for uh, let Brian kind of take the lead on that, but pray that God might root out any kind of issue of racism in our hearts in any way. Amen. Larry, why don't you come up here as well? well us three will pray. Yeah, you can stand in the middle. I'm going to put my arm around you. Is that going to make you feel awkward? <laughs> Side hug. Well, Lord, we do just want to come right now and thank you for both of these incredible messages, Lord. And Father, we, we do come right now and we ask you, Lord, to search our hearts, not to get unnecessarily introspective, but Lord, for the Holy Spirit to shine light into our hearts deeply that any area of racism or any ism for that matter, God, of I'm better than you because I have this and you don't have this, or whatever it would be, the pride that's associated with it, Lord, the, all that's related to that, Father, just that you would come in with your sword, the sword of the Spirit of God, and you would cut between the soul and the spirit to divide down into the bone and the marrow to show us the intents and the thoughts of our hearts, Lord that we would embody, I pray, what it means for the church to become one. 
Lord, where there is no Jew or Gentile, there is no black and white, there is no male or female, God, but we are all one in Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Lord God, that you would bring that probing search into our hearts, Lord, of anything in us, God, where there might be racism, there might be offense, there might be unforgiveness, there might be hurt, there might be pain, Lord. And, Lord, let the change in our nation begin in the church. That is, Lord, Jesus Christ is the only ultimate solution to racism. And, Lord, I am all for any law, any legislation, any political reform, Father. But ultimately, it is the love of God poured out on the heart that causes men and women to be one, to love each other without distinction or class or race or any of that, Lord, that you would search our heart, Lord, we pray, and you would purify our heart. Let the love of God be poured out. Let forgiveness be released. Like Larry had to forgive. He, Lord, like he said, where he said that the racism was in him, and it shocked him. And I, I just pray that you would expose right now in our hearts, Lord, any areas of racism, Lord, any areas, God, of distinction and that would divide because you have taken the distinctions lord you have taken every dividing wall and you have crucified every dividing wall on the body of jesus christ and now you have made the two into one you did it with jew and gentile the most hostile of enemies throughout history you you're doing it now with black and white male and female God, every nationality, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And we're asking you, Lord, to unite our hearts together as one. Lord, let the love of God be poured out upon our hearts, not just here, but in, in the church around America or the church around the world, that we would be one even as you are one. I pray, Lord, where we have an incredible opportunity right now, Lord, where Jesus said that they might be one, even as we are one, that the world might see that you have sent me, that the church would be a testimony to the world of what it looks like when a group of people who have the Spirit of God in them, the Spirit of Christ in them, become one, and there's no distinction, and the world would look at them in utter amazement and say, how did you do this? We tried every law we could think of. We tried to eliminate this and eliminate that and the cancel culture and all that's involved going on. We tried riots and protests and all that stuff, but you have something different. What is it? It's, it's Christ, the most unifying person in history. We're asking for that, Lord. Just do that work in us. Do that work in your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, unify us for the battle. Yeah, cool. Clean us up, Lord. Prepare us for the battle. Show us what's in our heart that needs to be moved, moved out of the way so we can be that flow that you want us to be, so we can be those representative of you that we need to be, Lord. Teach us to surrender totally. Nothing we decide to do, nothing matter uh, if we don't surrender. We have to totally surrender to you, Lord, for you to carry this battle. Lord, I pray and thank God. I thank God. I see the movement uh, 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 with, with where black people have come, how far we have came. And, but we're not giving thanks for that, Lord. Put it on our heart. We got to be appreciated for what we got to get more. And we got to thank you, Lord. You, 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 you have come a long, we have come a long way through you, Lord, and it was all because of you. Uh, I, was, I was dreaming about back in the slavery days how that was... Uh, old men and old women that was praying for freedom. They didn't know you, Lord, like at least they, they knew your parents better than a lot of us know you because they call up on you, Lord, and you cause white men to fight white men to free black men. So we got to give you thanks for that, Lord. We got to raise our, our voice to say, Lord, praise you and thank you for what you've already done. But, Lord, we got another battle now. I pray, Lord, you shut the mouth of the ones that are stirring up the trouble Amen. and open the mouth of your people the ones that you call for to speak, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray these things. Yes.